series of projects that built often out of those initial grants into more um, sophisticated research rather than the initial networking that took place. Even before October 2019, the Irish Research Council came to Daria, Ireland, and a number of us from a number of universities, um, Maynooth, Trinity, Galway, Cork and others, all came together to co-create a text that really grounded the call, the initial call in who we are and what we do. Our focus initially was about creating and sustaining new knowledge from outside traditional canonical epistemic biases um, through creativity, critique and transdisciplinary collaboration, including industry and cultural heritage. A clear focus emerged. You can see there that the centrality is on knowledge, is on Wissenschaft, is on knowledge work and knowledge making. Um, and the humanities and the human are central. This centrality of human knowledge, and also you can see practice, creativity and critique highlighted, really speaks to um, the work of those two days. These are the words of all of those participants, um, which I uh, hand-tooled in, and of course uploaded then to Voyant so that we could visualise it in a number of interesting ways. And when I, when I drill down a little bit into kind of the links uh, data, you could see very clearly that there were community needs emerging and also that there was a sense that there were a number of bar barriers to overcome as well within our community. It became an impact case study for Daria EU as it was such a broad ranging grassroots led really bottom-up approach to creating funding calls and then having successful networking funded partnerships and ultimately of course partnership in research across the two countries the many nations the grassroots rationale was very clear that we were positioning the uk and ireland as global forerunners in the field to exploit our complementary strengths and establish new transformative international research partnerships, which of course was achieved, but also to generate multi-level impact, academic, societal and economic, by fostering new partnerships with creative industries, by enhancing public access to and engagement with cultural heritage, and working together to create new standards in open access, for example, around minority languages, and supporting new learning, educational and professional skills. And now I turn over to my colleague, Jane. Thank you very much, Ola. I'm now going to talk briefly about some of the work that was done in the UK, which fed into the UK Ireland bilateral programme that Ola has just been describing. Two reports were commissioned in 2017. The first was an analysis of digital humanities research, teaching and practice in the UK. The second was a survey of attitudes to a national DH association. Running in parallel was the UK arm of the Daria Desir project, led by King's College London and the University of Glasgow. This held a series of evidence gathering workshops to identify suitable models for UK-European cooperation. This meant that there was a strong evidence base to feed in to the UK-Ireland scheme that Orla described. One of the projects that it funded was the UK-Ireland Digital Humanities Network, which ran from 2020 to 21. This was funded by the Arts and Humanities Research Council and the Irish Research Council, and led research and consultation towards the implementation of a permanent regional DH association. A series of workshops were held over the two years that generated reports which were made open for consultation before publication to ensure that they were as representative as possible. Returning to the two 2017 reports though, there's time to show you a few of the highlights. The key one for me was the strength in diversity of digital humanities in the UK. 51% of survey respondents described themselves as DH specialists. But that of course means that 49% didn't, even though they were sufficiently interested to engage with this work. Among research active respondents, 
38 different areas of research specialism were identified. Literature and history were the most commonly mentioned at 24% each, but 14 areas of specialism were mentioned by just one respondent. Here you can see a very simple visualisation of the range of areas of specialism that were identified by the DH survey respondents, and I'm sure this will have diversified still further in the years since 2017. The other main thing that we asked people about was whether they wanted a National Digital Humanities Association, and if so, what form should it most usefully take? The responses were overwhelmingly positive, as you can see from some of the quotations here. I don't really know why we don't have one. It's an excellent idea and I would really like to see something like that kicking off. I think it's a real thing that our community is lacking, and that sense of community came through very strongly in many of the responses. There were people also started to talk about the purpose of an association in these responses. If it leads to relationships, research and so on, absolutely. And finally, this is an excellent long overdue idea. That question of timeliness really came out very clearly for us. We also questioned people about the priorities for a DH association. And these are the key themes that emerged and have been picked up in the values that are now expressed for the association as it was launched last year. They were advocacy, a concern to increase recognition for DH, to provide a focal point for funding and to influence policy. There was a really strong concern with skills, training and career development, which I'm sure you won't find particularly surprising. And there was a really strong support for ECR, early career researcher training provision. There was a desire to support networking and collaboration, both interdisciplinary and cross-sectoral. And this is fed into the association's concern to recognise digital scholarship wherever it's happening, in universities, but also in the glam sector, galleries, libraries, archives and museums, and the creative industries. Sharing of best practice was also something which came up routinely. Interestingly, for me anyway, there was much less support for the organisation of conferences and the production of publications. In particular, there was very little enthusiasm for another journal. So you're going to hear from the other speakers now about how we've taken this work forward in practice and are implementing the association. But if you're interested in the reports that Orla and I have both mentioned, there are links to the texts on these slides. Thank you very much, everybody. Hi everybody, my name is Justin Tonra. Um, in this part of the talk, uh, I'm going to introduce the association's, uh, their core, the association's core values uh, and say a little bit about their development. So at the origins of the association, um, the group was built upon existing partnerships between academics in the field of digital humanities in the UK and Ireland. And the funding program which established the association's predecessor, uh, as you heard in, in Orla's talk, the UK Ireland DH Network. And this was an initiative jointly organized by the Irish Research Council and the Arts and Humanities Research Council, or the UK, or I as it subsequently uh, became. So the specific nature of that bilateral funding scheme and its requirements promoted both the principles and the practicalities of inclusivity, community and collaboration. These would continue to be core values of the network as it carried out its activities and of the association which succeeded it. Those Values were key to the daily activities of the association, as Michael will describe uh, in a moment. But the group also recognized that the partnerships uh, on which the network was built needed to be uh, expanded, to bring together different stakeholders and to consider and critically interrogate 
a set of core values and questions that are central to the field of digital humanities. Indeed, the association's core values were intended to transcend specific disciplinary or sectoral concerns in order, in order to include stakeholders from different fields and different backgrounds. An association that's inclusive of sectors beyond higher education is also key to establishing and sustaining new pathways for collaboration within the field. And at our um, first annual event and launch of the association in London two weeks ago, it was really very heartening to see um, very strong representation from people in the area of galleries, libraries, and museums, and the area also of creative industries at, at our event. In order that the association is inclusive of members from as broad a range of career levels as possible, the core values of sustainability and advocacy and action are to the fore. Sustainability and advocacy bring a focus to ensuring the continued st strength and viability of the digital humanities field in general and of our association in particular. Training and career progression are activities that fall under the rubric of advocacy and action and which relate not only to early career researchers, but to broader capacity building across as we know, a rapidly evolving field of digital humanities. And finally, in the interests of abiding by our values of openness and transparency, we'd like to move on to illustrate some of the ways in which these core values influenced the day-to-day -day activities of the association, with Michael discussing how these values influenced and shaped the organization of our first annual event. Thank you, Justin. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about that event and how our values connect to the day-to-day -day operations of the association. So we recently organized a two-day launch conference for the association in London, and this event provided us the first major public opportunity to put our core values into practice. The event team, which was Justin, Charlotte, and myself, looked to the core values at every point in the event design process and then followed through with implementation and delivery. And just to highlight a few examples of how those values influenced the choices we made, first, we would look at the call for papers. We shaped the call for papers deliberately around the core values themselves, with the idea being that this would allow for a wider range of people to submit, rather than focusing on specific disciplinary questions or technical issues. When it came to advertising the event, we cultivated what we call our list of lists, to ensure that the conference wasn't just advertised within communities who explicitly identify as digital humanists, but rather to those doing digital work in the arts and humanities more broadly. And then when it came to thinking about access at the event, we were really aware that travel and accommodation costs, particularly in London, can often make it unreasonable for people from outside of London or without a sort of stable contract to attend events like this. And so we committed fully half of our budget, or 2,000 pounds, to bursaries for early career researchers or for independent researchers. And this let us offer 10 200-pound bursaries for people to spend however they saw fit, whether that was accommodation, travel, or caring responsibilities. And we also provided an online option for people, so that way those who were unable to travel could still participate in the conference. And as Justin mentioned a little bit, we thought this bore a lot of fruit in who was able to present and attend. So we had representation from cultural heritage professionals, independent researchers, early career academics, as well as postgraduate students from the UK and Ireland, as well as a few colleagues from other, other places in Europe. And we're aware that these are sort of beginning steps and that there's a lot of room for improvement, particularly when it comes to access at events like that and that we're striving for good practice at the moment rather than best practice given the time and resource limitations for an association that's so early on in its um, life cycle, so to speak. And we also recognize that none of these interventions are groundbreaking on their own, but rather think of them together as important first steps to embedding the core values in our day-to-day -day operations. And then so as we think about what comes next uh, for a values-led organization, 
As we look to the future, we want to ensure that the association can remain a sort of stable foundation for the field, while at the same time adapting to change with the needs of those working within the field. And so to some degree, we anticipate the core values being future-proof. As they're expressed now, they're deliberately designed to be expansive. And our hope is that this will let the emphasis of the association's activities be shaped by a conversation between the communities the association serves and the core values. The values will remain consistent, but the way the membership would like to see them expressed will likely change over time. We hope that this ongoing dialogue will ensure that the core values remain essential to the day-to-day -day operations of the association and that they ensure that the association balances stability and growth in the coming years. And so now I will turn it over to Jennifer and Kristen to talk a little bit more about that community element. So going back for, to the time when we were considering applying for the network funding, now you probably all know that when you apply for, for a funding bid, you can't say, oh, well, we're going to establish this entire community that we need money and funding to establish, and we're going to get them all together, and they can vote on who actually applies for the money to establish them. This, of course, is a hypothetical that can't happen. But I think those of us who applied for and then won the grant to start framing this association idea always felt very um, aware of the fact that we couldn't be inclusive, we couldn't be representative unless we really worked very hard at that. So we brought together the partners we did by saying, well, we have the, the Daria uh, infrastructure on one side of the Irish Sea, and on the other side we had a series of Daria cooperation partners, and while this isn't representative in an elective sense, at least it is a group that is used to working together, and we felt that we could actually deliver that. But how could we take it from there? How could we actually get beyond who we were? And that was the challenge we faced. So I'm going to give you a kind of a what we did in the network phase, but also then how that will hopefully realize itself in the next phase of the, um, of the association. So again, we really had this concern that digital humanities, you know, the whole idea of this big tent digital humanities, <laughs> it actually isn't bigger on the inside. It looks big from the outside. You get inside, it's actually kind of kind of tight. So kind of a TARDIS in reverse, again, it's a UK Ireland thing. We can make references to Doctor Who. Um, so we, actually decided um, in October during the networking phase we would have an event on inclusivity and we would do everything we could to break the mold and make it be an event that embodied inclusivity in its program but also in its structure. So we had an open call uh, because we felt that if we had a committee saying let's have this theme and let's have this theme then already we were setting a bias in place. We accepted every proposal we got. Um, interestingly, even some that the committee was a little bit, or the, the kind of the organizers were a little bit uncomfortable with, and if you're interested to know what it was we were uncomfortable with, please ask me in the questions. Then we also said, okay, well, what about format? What if there were people who didn't want to do a half hour paper and all we offered was that? So we let people suggest their own format. We also asked potential participants to flag any concerns they might have or any kind of protection that they felt that they would need in order to be able to speak openly and freely and say what they wanted to say but not feel that they were taking undue professional or personal risks. We had experts come in and review both our call for papers and also the way we were managing the work we were doing just to make sure that perspectives we felt we didn't have represented would be there. And we were very careful about choosing our panel chairs and the timing of the sessions. Remember, this was pandemic time, so it was an online event, although it was kind of run from Dublin. It was merely virtual. Um, and we were also made it very clear to all participants that we had a set of ground rules that we were asking people to abide by in terms of respect and the dignity of their fellow participants. Now, as I said, we accepted everything that came in. And we organized it as best we could. And what I thought was really interesting is that some of the topics we were expecting really didn't emerge, whereas some that we weren't expecting came through very, very strongly from the community. And I think it was already mentioned before, this question of, for example, cultural heritage or industry, which we consider to be at the edge of digital humanities, they really wanted to be in. So we had a panel on digital humanities and access to cultural heritage. We had a panel on access to places and spaces, networks and communities. And this is where I think the early career researcher voice came out very strongly in that, that there were barriers for them and feeling like they were a part of the community and how we could actually integrate them more effectively. And then finally, we had a panel around structures. 
specifically around infrastructures, around uh, centers, around forms of organization that could embrace inclusivity. What we found ultimately was that access and inclusion means many things to many different people and sometimes these meanings can be quite conflicting. So it is something that always has to be negotiated. And that tension that exists between the global, the nomadic, the, the sort of the open intellectual aspect of digital humanities and knowledge creation generally, and the national desire to fund, to organize, to have KPIs and to have milestones and deliverables, that that was a really significant tension to have to uh, bring into some kind of balance. Um, there's the paradox of hierarchies and classifications. I feel like in a digital humanities audience, you don't have to, you know, everybody knows their broker and star, right? So we don't have to go too deep into that. Um, but it was something that we could see people were in boxes. And the challenge of getting people out of that boxes, bo those boxes and making everyone feel like it was an even conversation or an open conversation was important. And finally, that we had to address this at every level of the wider ecosystem but the win could be that the digital methods themselves could help us in doing that. So we took away some conclusions and some starting points. None of this is rocket science, but we realized you can't just do the inclusivity report and then be like, hey, we're done, we're inclusive, that's great. It's a process and you need to have it as um, uh, Justin and Michael have said, it needs to be a value of the organization, which is where that value statement very much comes from. But we also realized that it's really easy to talk about these things and really hard to do things. So making sure that we held ourselves to the notion of acting on these values was something that was very important. Um, and that there were going to be specific areas where we could make the most headway. Um, access to networking, access to heritage and of responsibilities in creating, remediating and processing cultural, social and historical content and uh, things around labor inequality. And not only were these things that we needed to sort of be aware of, but we needed to make sure that these were included in the skill set we were expecting of our early career researchers and that we were delivering to them. So not just to train them as researchers, but to train them as scholars in a, in a community. So that sort of describes the way within the network phase we approach this. So now I'm kind of, you have to imagine me changing hats so I'm now, I'm, I'm not going to do Kristen's accent, but it's actually not all that different from the way mine used to be. So, um, so taking over Kristen's part of the, the, the presentation, so we also have this forward-looking set of principles for how we're going to address EDI in the association. So, and, and when I refer to the collective, this is a sort of a word that's emerged for those of us. So there were the applicants and the participants in the network proposal that was funded by the AHRC and the IRC. And when that funding ended, very clearly something needed to be done, but who was gonna do it? So we figured that we were, we were the group who knew the most about it, so we just continued. But we didn't wanna call ourselves a steering board or a governing committee, because we weren't elected. So we call ourselves the collective, so just if you're wondering about the vocabulary. So the first thing we needed to do was look at inside and say, well, what are our existing institutional organizational practices for supporting equity, diversity, and inclusion initiatives? Whoopsie. I didn't ask for that. So rather than trying to write a document about inclusion, what we wanted to do is kind of build from what was already there, identify initiatives and practices that we felt had brought positive change. Again, this action orientation. Um, and then we wanted to review existing DH association and network statements on equity, diversity, and inclusion. Again, gathering together as much of that state-of-the-art baseline knowledge as we could. So that would allow us to acknowledge the work that has been done by established DH organizations and build on them. So the initial planning allowed us to write an inclusion and equity plan that complements the network association terms of reference. This, will, this, this document articulates actions, benchmarks, and metrics we can use to evaluate and report on the efforts, but it also has examples, including establishing a work stream for creating, implementing, and evaluating the bursaries in a fair and equitable way, and also identifying areas of leadership that will require collaboration and mentoring. Current work is around, for example, supporting the community interest groups. And this is something that would be really interesting to talk more about. I know we have at least one representative of, of a community interest group here in the room. Um, you know, so how are these groups who have come together going to be able to use this inclusion and equity plan? Um, these proposals came from people across career stages, modes of practice, areas of research interest. It's really quite an interesting group and unexpected to us as well. 
Uh, and the core requirement from them was that they'd have an action plan. So that is one of the ways that we felt inclusivity could be a part of what we were doing, but also implementing inclusion and equity guidelines and event planning. So peer review, feedback, bursaries, everything that we're doing needs to kind of have this value of inclusion there. Next steps, well, again, in this openness, working with Daria and the other UK and Irish research infrastructures to expand the equity and inclusion resources, and also um, to work with the colleagues in UKRI and Daria to expand cooperative partnership applications and investigate these kind of additional modes of engagement. Again, we think inclusivity is really a, a, a task for the whole ecosystem, and we as the, the association want to be a part of that. So we now move on to the next presentation, which is Paul Gooding from the University of Glasgow coming to us on screen. Paul Gooding, I'm a senior lecturer in information studies at the University of Glasgow and part of the collective for the UK and Irish Association. Sorry I can't be there today, but I'm hoping to talk to you all a little bit about how we've approached the issue of advocacy. We're going to do a little bit of framing work, and then I'm going to update you all on what we've done to date during the project, and also talk a little bit more about how we're moving forward to develop an advocacy position statement. So I'm going to get onto the, the workshop in a little more detail that I've pulled this quote from in a minute. But in putting this talk together, I was really struck by, by the idea that Jennifer Edmund gave in this quote about the close links between advocacy and infrastructure. This quote was given in the, broad, in the context of a broader discussion about advocacy and infrastructure, and specifically the need to ensure that our definitions of infrastructure incorporate both people and existing networks of collaboration. And I think this is a really important point that, that, that's shaping my thinking and, and I think also the work being done that, that when we refer to advocacy, when we refer to infrastructure, the thing that underpins that is people and not as kind of units of work, but as humans with particular interests and particular contributions to make to both DH and to the, the wider um, context within DH operates. And it's worth noting as well that the, um, the scope and scale of DH in the UK and Ireland has been quite widely widely studied in recent years. There was a 27 report commissioned by the School of Advanced Studies looking at DH in the UK. There was a 2020 report led by Giles Berger and Pip Wilcox on sustaining digital humanities in the UK. And there was also more recently Michelle Doran's report on the state of DH in Ireland. And those reports are really valuable because they show how DH is, is situated within local education norms, political context, and funder priorities, but is simultaneously a matter of, of national and transnational collaboration. And this is the context in which our workshop emerged. So the situated and varied nature of DH on the one hand, and the collaborative nature and the cross-national boundaries that that involves um, make it challenging to develop a cross-border approach to communicating the value and impact of DH. Issues that are hugely important to the UK aren't relevant to Ireland, but there are issues that are. So part of the challenge here is to tease out the things that are relevant to both communities or the things that are relevant to one community and absolutely key to be considered but aren't necessarily relevant to the other. So we therefore designed a workshop to foreground and discuss key issues for DH in the UK and Ireland. Um, that might have policy or engagement related implications. The workshop was structured around three topics, research, teaching and infrastructure. That workshop took place in March 2021 via Zoom and it had approximately 100 simultaneous attendees. And it was structured around four panels on those key topics, plus a final respondent panel to address emergent issues. And I've drawn out some of the issues and provocations that, that struck me from, from the workshop. These are all points that are included in the, the workshop report, which I've got a link to on the next slide, but I thought were worth further discussion to, to contextualize the, 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 um, the situation and, and how the community sees it. So the first one there is sustainability and the breadth of issues around sustainability for content, data, infrastructure, and researchers, um, and the situatedness aspect. So, so in the UK and Ireland, there's traditionally been a lack of formal advocacy at national level for things like career development, 
Uh, and that's that's been a key thing when you think of people like in my early career where I was um, at an institution where I was the digital humanities person. That links to both career development and sustainability issues. And finally, this this issue that Mike Pig raised that that DH doesn't necessarily, in his view, need to be lobbying as an individual field because of its close links to the arts and humanities and the pressures that, that the UK and Irish arts and humanities communities are under right now. So there's an importance of realising that DH sits in relation to other disciplines rather than a unique case. The workshop discussion paper is online at the following address. I'd encourage you to take a look if you haven't had the chance, because uh, with the time available allowed here, I've obviously been not able to provide as detailed an account as, as was done at the workshop. However, I'm going to focus briefly on the recommendations that arose at the end of the report, which you're going to see on the next slide. And that report concluded with several recommendations to help shape the association's approach to advocacy. The first was the need to recognise the differing academic, political and funding contexts of the constituent nations within the association. Not all issues are equally relevant to the UK and Ireland. And frankly, as someone who's moved to Scotland in recent years, I'm acutely conscious that we can't expect universal experiences across any of the UK nations. This then feeds into the need to develop a clear and transparent advocacy policy, which integrates representatives from different sectors that contribute to DH. We also felt strongly that an outward facing approach was needed, including working with other DH associations and a recognition that due to the situated and fragmented nature of DH practice, inclusivity would need to be a core value, not just of the association, but of our advocacy work. So where are we now? Well, as of this month, um, Jennifer Edmund has been leading on uh, the development of a DH Association Advocacy Position Statement and as of 7th of June 2023 that's now available online. It's available at the, the following link which I'll try and share in the chat today because I, I should be in attendance um, but it's a bit unwieldy on this slide I'm afraid. It covered key areas that map largely onto the workshop but adding that layer of public engagement to the key areas. And it also defines advocacy targets as situated in both political and institutional spheres. As the quote I've pulled out indicates here, the advocacy position statement looks to move beyond having a broad scope of advocacy as identified in our report and towards a more specific set of actions by which we can progress the cause of DH in our nations. So just to wrap up, what are these proposed actions? So first, we propose to undertake a stakeholder mapping exercise to help gain a more granular perspective on who and how to target advocacy. Second, we intend to undertake direct engagement with stakeholders and the DH community so we can start to determine um, synergies between the two via interviews and focus groups. Third, we'll look to develop a set of value propositions from the above and fourth, release a resultant value matrix to the community for consultation and obviously if approved, adoption. We're hoping, as Jennifer says in the statement, to end up with a quote, tailored, robust and extensible framework for promoting the interests of the DH community. Okay, thank you all very much for listening today and I will look forward to continuing this discussion both in the chat and hopefully online via the panel discussion. Thank you, everybody. Hello, everyone. So before starting to talk about the topic that was assigned to me on capacity announcement, just in addition to the advocacy uh, work, I think when Paul recorded that, um, that video, we hadn't started yet another action. Um, at the moment in the UK, so this is this mainly concerns the UK, there is a consultation around the research evaluation framework, which some of you might know about. It's quite an important exercise that happened at cycles of four or five years um, in the UK and basically directs the funding that goes towards um, higher education institutions. 
Um, so this consultation obviously is open there for the community and the association is now working to see how to respond to the consultation from the association point of view. So there'll be also a chance for the community to contribute to that. So in addition to the advocacy um, work they were doing. But my topic uh, for today is capacity enhancement, training and career pathways. First a disclaimer, so all the things that I'm going to say in the next five minutes uh, mainly come from the discussion paper that is also published online, so you'll find it on Zenodo. Um, the person that led that work uh, is Natasha Romanova, uh, but other members of the current collective as well as of the network at the time uh, contributed to that. Um, the kind of work and questions that uh, relate to this capacity announcement, announcement area and how the, that, that activity developed included things like um, question to the community about what would you like this network to, to provide, to, to, uh, to respond to, so they kind of aligned. We wanted to check basically whether the community still aligned with some of the, uh, the findings that uh, Jane mentioned in that landscape report that was done four years earlier. And indeed, the mapping was quite similar, so around the importance of advocacy and networking. Um, there were questions around technical infrastructures. Does your institution, organization, um, or setup settings have a technical infrastructure or not? Do you have teaching programs that are dedicated, whether formally or informally, to digital humanities and things like that? So it was a way both to have an icebreaker around some of these topics, but also to check um, the, the, the status of the community at the time. Um, but so the premise, what, what do we mean by um, enhancing capacity in the digital humanities research? Um, we mean first and foremost caring for and nurturing the human dimension of digital humanities infrastructure, so that was the, the core um, topic um, in line with those values that Justin and Michael outlined earlier on. Um, and also we had a firm belief that to sustain uh, the field um, we need clear roles, um, we need career progression, uh, training and education as the conduit, as the pillars um, for the field itself, for the sector, uh, in relation to also other disciplines in the arts and humanities, and extensively also social sciences, I would say. Um, so we held, as part of that network, uh, a workshop in 2020, so it was the first event of the, of the, of the network, sorry, um, on capacity enhancement, with quite a good participation, beginning of the pandemic, so all online, with a relatively healthy um, uh, sustaining attendees throughout the day. It was long and intense. Um, and we then combined, um, as I said, this work was mainly uh, led by Natasha Romanova. We combined the, 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 the remote uh, online workshop with a, a survey to the participants, also with a healthy participation. The day was organized um, with a first um, section on framing the problem in the UK and Ireland and mainly reflect on two parallel uh, areas around capacity enhancement. First, the uh, research software engineering uh, process development and training experiences. And second, digital humanities teaching and training activities. These were the main um, uh, foci, focus of the day. Um, and last but not least, the idea was to surface connection and gaps across sectors. So um, higher education, cultural industries, but also uh, gallery, libraries, archives, and museums. Uh, the, uh, the discussion paper ends also with recommendations, nine recommendations. I'm going to read them all, uh, but the ones in blue are, have basically already been highlighted as part of the other presentations. Um, so first, um, the importance of alignment and peer uh, participation, representation, and, uh, and account, accounting for the concerns both in the UK and Ireland, because they are different contexts, of course. Um, alignment with EU and international activities. A second, recognition and support for diversity of roles. Um, third, advocacy towards sustainability of funding, people, infrastructure, software, and data. Uh, four, integration of and collaboration across sectors. Five, network communication protocols alignment. Inclusivity, shared curricula, benchmarks, and marking criteria for DH degrees, internships, and work experiences association as broker. So again, as I said, the ones in orange are probably the ones that speak the most to me based on the experience I have working within a research software engineering unit, so a practical lab, but also the ones that haven't been mentioned in the other um, in the other themes that the, the, the network and the association worked on. So focused indeed on career pathways in particular and building. Um, capacity, enhancing capacity. 
So what have we done then uh, already? Um, I can't remember, I think it was Jennifer mentioned the community interest group. Uh, so there was already a, an interesting alignment ongoing in the community. So some of us were part of the a steering group that the um, um, Arts and Humanities Research Council commissioned um, to write a report and a series of recommendations for digital infrastructures in the arts and humanities coming from a research software engineering perspective. So that report is now published and one of the recommendations of, of that report was indeed to establish a more stable reference group for the research councils to uh, bring to the attention of the concerns, issues, uh, priorities of uh, research software engineers. And uh, interestingly, the association could respond in a bottom-up way to that call by indeed um, issuing a call for community interest group. And one of the groups that, was, um, um, that has become now a community interest group is the RSC in the Arts and Humanities. So you have there the information about the contact person for the, for the group, Anna Maria Sicani, who's based at the School of Advanced Study at the Digital Humanities Hub, like Michael. And then you have coordinators across Ireland um, and, and the UK. And I would encourage, if you're interested in, um, in that community, to get in touch, because it's really just starting. And they have 18 months to come up with some action plans, or we have, because I'm also part of that. And then in terms of what we also still have to do, or would like to do, um, this connects with the work on um, uh, community that uh, Jennifer was mentioning in advocacy. Uh, we want to work on, um, uh, on a report on, let's say, status um, about identification and alignment of sectors. So what are the sectors that really are relevant um, in the digital humanities at the moment in this wide sense? Can we um, create a common language or at least agree um, on uh, uh, common terminology or common concerns in digital scholarship that we can defined with an inclusive language, what are the areas of shared concerns across sector, and can we build sustainable uh, connections across those sectors? And I think this is it. Thanks very much. I'm going to talk briefly about international collaboration just to conclude this panel. And uh, given, uh, given that we're here uh, at this conference and given the people in the audience, it almost feels unnecessary to, uh, to have to advocate for this at all, but I rather I'd actually just like to talk about um, some of the thoughts that we've had about how that might work and some of the questions that we need to think about. Um, so while our fundamental focus is obviously on um, the, the people and the communities uh, in DH in uh, Ireland and the UK, it's extremely important that we look outwards, um, as uh, others have already uh, said in their presentations, to, to the international DH community. Um, we want to be able to expand our perspectives, our capabilities through conversations and shared activities with our international colleagues. We want to be able to explore and share uh, best practices and uh, think about how to document those. We want to learn from other people. We want to learn alongside the experiences and needs of other DH communities um, and think about how those needs uh, and experiences interact with those of the UK and Ireland. Now, obviously, there are some challenges in that. We all know that. Um, I think in, uh, you know, depending on the context, any of these uh, points could be seen as, as challenges or, or opportunities. Um, so distance, coordination across different time zones, obviously diversity of languages, cultures, experiences, priorities, different working practices, different career paths, uh, variations in budgets and funding sources, and different levels of, of support for DH, you know, uh, institutionally uh, and nationally, and also different conceptions of, of DH. So bearing all these things in mind, we, we really want to ensure that we can support collaboration and collaborative activities uh, for our kind of mutual benefit, um, not only within uh, Ireland and the UK, but also uh, well beyond uh, our shores in whatever way that makes most sense uh, for those communities. So there are some questions for us to consider. What can our association um, contribute to DH internationally? So what can we, what can we bring, uh, how can we complement existing uh, networks and activities in what we do? How can we share our core values um, of inclusivity, community, collaboration, sustainability, openness and transparency, uh, transparency, and advocacy and action? 
through the ways that we represent our communities um, on an international level. And as Jennifer discussed, there, there can be this tension you know, between the global nature of DH and the desire to organize and, and fund its activities on a regional uh, or national basis. So how can we uh, best work uh, actively to, to help overcome some of those tensions? And what are the practicalities involved in creating and maintaining successful uh, collaboration uh, and activities between organizations across multiple borders and infrastructures? Um, obviously, many of us have, have already been involved in some way in organizations uh, and projects that reach across uh, different countries, and we're well aware um, of some of the challenges that can raise. And so I think bringing up the, our experiences together, talking to each other to kind of address those uh, will be a really key factor in the success of any initiatives that the association wants to achieve. Um, so answering or kind of moving towards addressing some of these um, it's only going to be possible through active participation in, the, in existing communities and, and initiatives. And so we need to be considering the association's relationships uh, with, with existing DH organizations. So we're thinking obviously of ADHO uh, and, and EADH, uh, but also of the, the many um, national DH organizations um, that, that, that there are. So um, this is something that will take place as the, uh, as the organization or as the association sort of moves from its current kind of structure, which is, uh, as you've heard, to have this uh, collective of those of us who've kind of been involved in the network, as we move towards thinking about a governance structure uh, and a membership structure, um, we will obviously be discussing how those relationships will work. We have had some uh, initial discussions uh, with, with Daria. Uh, we had uh, um, Akiati and Ed with us uh, in our uh, launch events in London. And it's worth pointing out perhaps that uh, Ireland is already uh, a member of Daria and the UK has one cooperating partner currently and there are several cooperating partnerships that are in discussion and will hopefully um, come to fruition. So we're going to be thinking about how we can work as a member and as cooperating partners, um, how we can work with Daria to kind of support our, our activities. Um, so what do we need uh, from you and from the DH community more generally? Well, we, we need input, obviously, from you about what kind of activities you want to see the association doing internationally. We're really, really open to ideas. We want to hear what people think. We need to learn from other people's experiences about what works and what doesn't work. And we have already um, done a little bit of that already. We had a workshop um, towards the, the end of the, the network that looked at some of the practicalities of DH organizations, how they're set up, how they run, and so on, which is a really useful um, workshop. We need a vision of how we can build collaborations that are genuinely useful uh, and worthwhile to, to everybody sort of on the ground. So establishing what that means for us all right from the start. And that might mean that we have to concentrate at first on sort of some of our core activities that we're hoping to do rather than, than others. Um, so we need to, to uh, discuss that. We need time to bring uh, meaningful and uh, productive uh, collaborations to fruition. So building, building them over a number of years in a thoughtful way. Um, and to do that, we need to commit, obviously, to having regular conversations, regular contact with, uh, with colleagues internationally. We need to think about practical support for navigating the various different priorities and systems that we're going to encounter. Um, and crucially, I think we need flexibility. Uh, what we need to do is likely to change over the course of time. Uh, we're not imagining it's going to be a fixed thing. And I think it's really key that we actually plan to be, uh, to be flexible. Um, just to, to conclude, I'd say at this stage in the setting up of the association, I think we've got a really ideal opportunity to consider how we're going to interact as an association with the international DH community um, and to define what we want to achieve um, as, a, as, as that wider community. And the discussions that we'll have here, hopefully um, in, the, in the questions afterwards and the discussion, um, and also perhaps in, in some of the, the more informal discussions over coffee, um, will I hope really help us to do that. Thank you. So maybe the speakers can all come up and sit here. And I don't know how we manage the, um, the folks who are on the, the chat. 
whether that should be put up there or whether it will just be yelled out to us. Um, but this is, this is the time for questions, comments, input of all sorts that anyone might have to either inspire us, poke us, or indeed help us to, to develop uh, or ask us how we've come up with the ideas we have. And I suppose usually the chair is supposed to ask a question if nobody has a question, but it would be kind of strange to be asking questions of myself. So I'm really counting on one of you. Ah, excellent. Please, please. Or the cube, as it were. <laughs> Thank you so much. Uh, Lee P. Saxon, University of Exeter. Uh, so obviously, I've now I've said congratulations to, to, to all of this team um, at our meeting in London, but I think it's worth is saying again, it's a huge amount of work that you've already put into it, and, and it's really exciting to see it kind of uh, moving on. Um, so I guess just as a, kind of a conversation to, uh, a discussion to get the discussion going, obviously the, the kind of notionally, uh, you know, banner headline thing about this whole association is this the UK Ireland Digital Humanities um, Association, and, and there's a kind of a, a kind of pairing of those. Of it's it's unusual. I mean, okay, so there are other e, uh, there are other DH organisations which also cover multiple countries, um, but I'm aware that many of the motive, the, the forces and incentives and things which impact on us in our daily lives as as um, academics or um, folk in the glam sector or professional services, wherever we may be are very national and they will you know the, the opportunities to collaborate are in committees which are often national and the funding calls are often in you know encourages to kind of operate together and so there's a risk that we wind up with two effectively one kind of banner thing but basically there's a bunch of uk people working together and there's a bunch of you know people in ireland working together um so really the, the question is what mechanics or mechanisms can we introduce to make sure that 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 doesn't risk kind of happening, and that it's a it's a joint organisation in name only. So I answered a question quite similar to this two weeks ago at our launch event, and I think I'll give a quite similar answer on this occasion. I don't think it's a simple. Um, problem to resolve, and I think it is a, a very important factor to, to keep in mind. Uh, on the occasion two weeks ago when I was asked, when we were asked this, I, I said that it would be important to try and have more of the funding schemes that led to the, um, the creation of the network that preceded this association. Um, my sense was that I think one of, one of the factors that led to that scheme was perhaps some anxiety from within the UK about um, the political developments which separated it from, from the rest of, of the, the continent in some senses and a desire to keep up that, um, that cooperation and collaboration which had, which had you know, naturally arisen um, with European partners in, in a bilateral relationship with Ireland. So I think if we can encourage our respective funding bodies to, to continue um, creating schemes of that kind, that would be one way to, to do this kind of thing. And I think the, the evidence of the success of that uh, initial scheme and, and its subsequent larger funding scheme is, is there to, to be seen. Several of the um, projects that arose from those schemes are presenting panels and papers at this, uh, at this conference, uh, including people in the audience here. So I think we, we can point to the value and success uh, and the fruition of that initial scheme and say, let's, let's do it again. Um, and I think to pick up on one really specific example of how we've built that in, when we put out the call for community interest groups, um, which just to provide a little bit of context on those, although I think most of you would be familiar with the idea of sort of a special interest group or a working group within an association context, 
we wanted to provide an opportunity for people within the UK and Ireland DH communities to propose the work that they were interested in doing, and whether that was research specific, so people proposed specific research areas that they were interested in collaborating, or issues like climate, or protecting researchers in specific contexts, or looking at communities of interest, so research software engineering, for example. And when we put those calls together, there was a really explicit push in them that the people submitting them should be representative of Ireland and the UK. So we didn't make it a strict requirement, but we very strongly encouraged that the applications have at least one applicant from both countries. And when we did the peer review process, when we saw that that representation was lacking, that was often one of the strongest pieces of feedback we got. And we also offered to help applicants connect with people if they didn't have networks in the other country. And that, I think, was really positive in the sense that most of the people, when they applied, did that anyway, but for the folks who didn't, we were able to help connect them with someone with a shared interest. And so now all of the community interest groups are representative of people working in both national contexts. And that, I think, is something we're committed to looking forward in the future, not that you can't propose something that is specifically Irish or specifically British, but rather we want to encourage people to think about where those connections are and how they can use that vehicle to work across those countries. And maybe just one other thing to add, that obviously within the UK, there is more than one country. <laughs> um, so another thing that we try to do in um, kind of renewing or reboosting the partnership with Daria is to make sure that all those countries are represented. And that was the initial, when the, that cooperating partnership was initiated, Wales, England, and Scotland were all represented. Um, now they're not. Um, so. On one end, the association obviously wants to leave it to the community to decide whether it makes sense for institution to be associated with DARIA, but proactively we're trying to connect the DARIA officers with representatives from each of those countries. Clearly this is a very interesting topic. Just one more word on this because I think that when we first started the network proposal, you know, there was a bad case scenario and the bad case scenario was it just became a UK thing with Ireland kind of hanging around on the back. And actually, it was really interesting to see how in the time of working together, we actually learned the, the complementary, you know, we had the reports, but we actually learned the complementarity of our strengths. And I do remember one time when it was sort of like, there was somebody who'd done a, a set of slides or something, and, and it, we realized we'd forgotten. They, they realized that they had somehow forgotten Ireland. It was like, ah, kind of we're here too, let's. But that actually had become, came, became very natural. We realized that sort of the worst case scenario then moved. We're like, the worst thing, of course, it would be like a middle school dance. So it's very, very kind of US sort of image where you've got the, you know, you got the, the, the Irish on one side, the English on the, the, the Scottish over there and the Welsh over there. And, you know, and everybody's kind of like in their own corners, kind of like, you know, sort of dancing to soft sell. You have just <laughs> totally, totally exposed my age. But then you can imagine that there is that possibility of mixing. And that's where you know, the cultural links are so strong, the institutional links are so strong. We figured that there was just so much to win. And then to be able to say, you know, when there is a, con a consultation about the ref, you know, obviously we live in fear of anyone in, in the Irish political sphere actually getting an idea that a ref in Ireland would be a good thing. But that means also we can provide different kinds of input and different kinds of, 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 you know, ask different sorts of questions. So again, it's really interesting how we've seen this convergence, certainly, again, amongst those of us who are having the conversation, and it gives us really, really good hope for the productiveness of that later set of, of convergences that can happen in the SIGs and, and the lighter, larger community. Really? Sorry, we should go to the next question. Sorry, uh, over absolutely. here. Can I, can I just also kind of comment? I think it's worth reflecting that most of the AOs uh, and affiliate organizations, I think, from EADH are also cross-national. Mm -hmm. So there may be lots to learn from their experiences yeah. as well about how they've been successful yeah. in, in, in bridging between yeah. Yeah, different, different countries. Great, and thanks. actually, I mean, coming from the, the Daria background as well, the Daria experience, we have national members but very, very strong regional hubs, and those regional hubs have been some of the, the best drivers in DH in Europe that we've seen, you know, kind of the Benelux and the Nordics and, you know, the, the, the sort of the German-speaking area. So again, we've seen that sort of from our perspective in Ireland as well. Please. Hi, um, I'm Melissa Terrace from the University of Edinburgh, and I think it's wonderful that we're getting a UK and Irish community, and I'm going to use that word because I think this is really what you're trying to build, and the power of having a community and knowing other people and other organizations and 
knowing other people, not only in universities, but libraries, archives, museums who are tapped into this space, allows us to bootstrap so much more quicker when it comes to writing grant applications, when it comes to putting together a panel. So that's really kind of, I see this as the community trying to build those links. I've got a suggestion for you and a question. And my suggestion was, well, I, I couldn't make it to the first meeting and the reason was because the dates that were chosen it was the day that the Scottish schools all Scottish schools across Scotland broke up so anyone with children couldn't make that date and that was why so many children so many people didn't come from Scotland to this so we were all like oh well you've excluded Scotland already um, and so I just be very cognizant of that when you're looking at dates we all work Ireland Scotland England work towards slightly different calendars and as someone who moved from England to Scotland I hadn't realised how discriminatory we had been when I was in London choosing dates that just suited England. So this is a UK wide association so just bear that in mind. But the, the um, question is, I'm such an engineer and I heard a lot of words there and I'm trying to translate it into practical things like what does it actually mean that you're going to do? Is it a once a year meeting? Are you doing it again? When are you doing it next year? Where are you doing it next year? Do you, are you looking for hosts? Is it a meetup in different cities? Are we going to be organising that? Is it a shared writing sprint on something? Is it an online like hour where we've all got the hashtag and we're all just talking about who we are? Like, What are the practical things that you're going to do now to build that community and to keep the community going in between the annual meeting? Thank you. Sure. Are we on? Yeah. Okay. So thanks very much uh, for that. Uh, those very good points, and we will uh, we will note the the point about being very cognizant of people's calendars. Um, I'm I'm embarrassed that that happened, um, and yeah, we'll make sure it doesn't again. Um, in terms of the you know the the activities that that we we're, we're thinking of uh, you you asked about the the uh, annual events and, and how that was going to go so we sort of we committed to to having uh, to an, uh, an event each year but i think we are very open to what that's going to involve. So um, for, the, for the first one, we wanted it um, essentially to be our, our opportunity to launch the association. But my sense is that we, we actually, we really actively want people to suggest what they would like uh, the, the events to, uh, to be uh, and how they'd like uh, us to run that. We, we definitely, I suppose, given that we're a collective we, at the moment, we, we don't want to impose our views of, of how that should be done. We very much want to seek, uh, seek people's views. I suppose, um, you know, having already held workshops on uh, each of the kind of the key themes, we, we obviously want to, to continue um, making sure that we're um, uh, sort of bringing those themes uh, constantly into the actions that, that we uh, that, that, that we do um, as an association. So uh, we might want to have further events that uh, focus around those themes. We might want to consider, you know, bringing people in. I'm, I'm going slightly off piece here, I guess, but thinking about the the governance structure, which we will be looking at putting in place in the second year, one of the things that you might want to consider is having you know, uh, one person uh, representing each of the, the themes uh, that, that, that we're, uh, our core values. Um, and perhaps for them to take the lead on the activities uh, that can support those themes best. Um, sorry, I'm, I'm, feel free to come in. Uh, but, I mean, yeah. Um, I think just to sort of yes and those comments, we got some really excellent feedback at the end of that first event where a few people reflected, I think without a specific answer, but they were sort of asking, is another conference something we need? Um, and if it is, what does that look like and what makes that different from existing conferences? And some of the suggestions that came for that were things like hackathons or workshopping days or events that make space for some sort of structured networking. I think that's something we're sort of really interested maybe to experiment a couple of times with to see what is a good use of that time and space and particularly how can we provide the resources to make that valuable. Like nothing saying you can't just organize a hackathon on your own, so what's the value of a UK Ireland hackathon and how can we make that a more impactful thing for our community? I definitely think it's a thing we're still thinking about. Do 
Um, yeah, and I think what Ariana is pushing me to mention is we're also, until we sort of think and have a structure about what membership looks like, where you're at the point where if you've signed up to the mailing list or put your name in on the website, you are a member, um, or if you think you would like to be a member, you're kind of a member through a speech act, if you will. But one of the, I think, best ways to feed back to us at the moment is if you have a thought like that, we've got an email address that is very open, and if you want to sign up to the mailing list, if you want to sign up to the list on the website, or if you just want to send us sort of a thought you have as it pops into your head, at the moment, that's the kind of most exciting thing for us is to see people interested and engaged and sort of responding to those avenues so that way we can take that on board as we're thinking about what comes next. Thanks. Uh, I wanted to check in as well and see if there's anything in the chat that needs mention because I know that they often get ignored. Great, okay. I'm Sarah Hoover. I'm currently at the University of Galway, uh, postdoc with CLS Infra, so obviously the infrastructure questions are really interesting to me. And especially hearing you talk about um, advocacy, the basis of good advocacy is always evidence. So a question or thought would be, are there uh, existing research projects that we could borrow from um, that emphasize the value of cross-border work like this? Can we, could we look towards producing a piece of research demonstrating in the different fields that are around DH how this kind of organization benefits individual project outcomes, careers, institutions, communities? We could probably find funding for it. <laughs> I'm, <laughs> I'm looking at Jennifer. <laughs> um, it, it's interesting that advocacy came out so strongly in the original consultations. I think people really felt that, I mean, no one can ever be the voice for a community, community as diverse as this, but there can be a voice. And you know, there's always that kind of, well, when I want to call Europe, who do I call? When I want to call digital humanities, who do I call? Um, and it's better to have some phone number, even if it's an imperfect one, than have none. And have just the impression that this is a very dis... dis you know, all, all of the conceptions about humanities as being fragmented and being atomized and no one agrees about anything. You know, so I think that this is one of the reasons why that desire for there to be an advocacy role for an association was there. Um, the way I think that works, and the reason why we, the, the advocacy position paper is a little bit tentative, because to advocate well, you have to know what you're advocating for and to whom, and that requires both the mapping of the stakeholder landscape and the mapping of the interest landscape. And this is why instead of saying, right, we're going to rush in and do this, we said, we're going to study it first. And we, we do believe, however, we can actually find resources to make that work happen, because that is work. It's not something that volunteers could do well. However, coming from the, the Daria background, you know, one of the things that we put into the strategic plan was that policy, which essentially is advocacy work in the Daria context, would be one of the things that we as an infrastructure would do. Because we had that sense of what was going on up above and down below. And that's where I really hope the association can be and that that comparative framework between you know, the political chaos that is Ireland and the political chaos that is the UK. I mean, let's face it, all politics is chaos. And uh, anyone who doesn't know that Ireland's been embroiled in a huge scandal around a broadcaster who got paid too much money. I mean, is that still going on, lads? Uh, so, it's only you know, slightly less seamy than the UK broadcaster scandal. <laughs> I was gonna say, we are united. Being able to kind of listen to the community, push those needs upwards, see what's happening at that higher level and push that information downwards is incredibly valuable. And once we know, you know what up and down really is, I think we'll be able to really do something there. But you're right, there are experiences we can draw from and there are places we can get to support that. I don't know if anyone else wants to come in on that. Maybe just the only thing, that, again, a practical comment is that the HRC and the Irish Research Council still have plans to have future calls for collaboration. So I think be prepared and start working together on ideas. It's, it's a very good thing to do. And what Charlotte was 
and saying before about uh, planning, flexi planning for flexibility, I think it's a really good thing. So on one end, we don't want to just create reports of the reports of the reports. Obviously, we want to understand the community and, and for, before doing things that might not represent the community, but at the same time, we need to be proactive when things are happening and being able to react and involve the community. So the ref example is, is another thing that is happening now. And so the best we can do is involve the community, but we need to do it now. We cannot wait until you know, that, that train is gone and left. I think Sarah's point is, is really good and, and interesting as well. And I wonder whether, you know, you'd think this would be something that would be great for the funding bodies themselves to do, but they don't have the time or the capacity probably to do this kind of thing. Um, so I wonder whether they would go for something like this as a, as a like a meta-analysis research project of, of the kind of cross-border um, research uh, grants that you're, you're talking about. Mm -hmm. Maybe, yeah. Um, you know, in, in the context of you know, further funding calls to come, I should also mention the, the recent call that there was between Republic of Ireland and Northern Ireland for cross-border um, uh, research grants as well, and I'm not sure whether those are going to happen again. But well, and actually, I mean, speaking about advocacy, I mean, you know, on the UK side, there's this review of the REF. On the Irish side, there is the merger of our research councils and the loss of the Irish Research Council, which is being merged into, and it looks like a hostile takeover. And I think that's the kind of place where, you know, if we can provide a sort of a semi-external voice, you know, into looking at the REF, maybe you guys can provide that sort of input into, well, why you actually need a research council. So again, there is that, that real complementarity there that we can actually lean on each other when we need a comparator as well. Hi, thank you very much. Um, for those of you that don't know me, uh, Vicky Garnett, Training and Education Officer for Daria, also in Trinity College. Um, I've got a shameless plug, if I may, and then an actual question. Um, so my shameless plug is that I'm one of the co-chairs for one of the community interest groups, the Protecting the Investigator in Traumatic Research Areas in, uh, Community Interest Group. And we are forever looking for members, people who are interested in um, looking into um, uh, contributing to the work that we'd like to do. We're aiming to create uh, best practice guidelines um, that can be used universally within institutions, both um, academic and um, GLAM sector, uh, for researchers and practitioners at all levels. So if you're interested in um, taking part in something like that, then come and talk to me afterwards or come and find me at the Daria booth at some point. Um, my actual question, though, <laughs> is um, for Ariana. Um, obviously, putting my training and edu education hat back on, um, I wondered if you could expand a bit more on the training and education side within this um, association and how you would like that to develop and what supports perhaps Daria or other research um, infrastructures could support you in that. Thanks. Um, so I can say that, as I said, in that capacity announcement aspect, there were at least two parallel strands connected, but different one was the research software engineering one. Um, and at least in the UK, there has been an effort to um, propose training. So in the last, now I think it's the second round of a summer school for RSE training in the arts and humanities. Originally, this was supposed to be funded, but it's not been funded. So institutions like King's College London, King's Digital Lab, um, Cambridge, Alan Turing Institute got together and put a little bit of their in-kind time to organize a summer school two years ago, and they're doing it again this year. And interestingly, they left the application process open and there was a lot of international applications coming. So we got about over 500 applicants. And so it was decided that we would do a small face-to-face um, -face event with obviously the people that could come face-to-face, -face, but then open the remote um, participation to all of the applicants. As an app yet, I think it's at the end of July, so we'll see how that goes. But that could be an interesting model, and the idea would be indeed to provide some stats to the HRC and the Irish Research Council and see whether they could find ways of sustaining something like that, especially if we have evidence of that participation. And obviously, it's a small thing. It's a summer school, so you know, it's, it's not a, a, a teaching program or a training program that is longer, but it's something. 
In terms of the teaching, I'm not probably the best qualified to, say, to, to talk about that, um, but there was definitely high demand um, in the community for benchmarking, sharing of curricula. So as you were saying, for example, the idea of having more information about the UK island schools of the age teaching included into the register, um, more, more training uploaded into the Daria campus platform. So one of the things that we want to work on with Daria is, is exactly that, so to involve via the current cooperating partners, which are now three, by the way, <laughs> from the UK since a few weeks ago. Um, yeah, try to, trying to announce that, but I don't know if any of you want to say more about teaching and training since you're more involved than I am. I guess the one thing that I would say is that First of all, I just want to say, you know, just to call out the two community interest groups that you've heard a bit about today. I mean, if you think about how different they are, it just shows you, again, how I think this group is trying to encourage people to sort of take the obvious answer and then go beyond it. Um, and I think that that's been really successful. And I think for teaching and training as well, you know, obviously, okay, like, there's a desire for teaching and training, so let's provide teaching and training. That's the wrong answer. How can we harness all the knowledge, all the skill, all the activity, all the materials that are already in there, either to enhance kind of at a train-the-trainer level or to make things available publicly? And I think that's really, I mean, going back to Melissa's comment about, well, what are you going to actually do? You say you're going to be action-oriented. I think it is about kind of saying, okay, well, you know, the obvious answer is have a journal. But we don't want a journal. Nobody wants another journal. But early career researchers want to feel like there's a place where they can publish. So if that's the real need, how can we answer that differently? So I think it's actually about making sure we have those open dialogues and that good creative thinking that says, okay, this is what people normally do. That's the proxy for meeting this need. And how do we do that next? And I think, obviously, I think Daria can be a great partner in that. Are there any other questions? either from in the community and near the community, left or right, yeah, actually, I think, let's see, is there a, is there a microphone to throw at you? Oh. Good to see you. Hiya, so I'm a PhD, second year PhD based at the UCD, University College Dublin. Just a quick question, because I, um, the field from, from which I come from, let's say, it's archaeology, but now I'm based at the School of Information and Communication Studies. And I can tell for my two teeny tiny years of very short experience, let's say, that librarians and archivists are extremely interested in digital humanities skills, and they don't have it in their curricula, pretty sure, because they keep on. My supervisor, Amber Cushing, she delivers digital curation core concepts, and that's the only module they have on the topic. So she kind of goes towards a bit the digital humanities, but she stops there because nobody has really a background. And the other, the other one module we do is just like apply the research methods and that's it. And that again goes towards that. Yeah. And that's it. I mean, uh, I think there are many, many, many stakeholders, potential stakeholders of an association like that. So it's not just like the DH, strictly DH community. I think it's way broader. And really, if I can do something, although I'm just a PhD, but whatever I can do, I will do. <laughs> to make it a bit more resonant, you know, to, to resonate a bit uh, among these communities, because there are many, but they just don't know how to connect, or maybe they have even preconceptions. I realize that many, many times I've been hearing like, oh no, the age, no, no, it's not my field. No, I, okay, I'm kind of, I get their point, but it's too much computational. Uh, well, it's not, it's just an umbrella term, I think. Mm -hmm. So there are so many differ uh, differences, and I think it's really valuable, the report you got, with all these specific applications that you can find in the age. And I feel like that it's not still out there enough to be heard. Mm -hmm. So I think people like me, or maybe, of course, with a bit more power, can kind of try to push it push the message a bit ahead. That's just my observation, but yeah. <laughs> yeah, maybe to add to, to what you said, what I forgot to say before about that, um, those trends of training and, and capacity enhancement is that one of the presentations that I think was quite interesting at that workshop came from uh, the National Archives. Pick Wilcox presented the scheme for apprenticeship. So something that it's different and beyond the way that we traditionally think about training and teaching in an academic setting. And that has a lot of potential also for alternative careers that not necessarily follow the traditional academic path, but yet there's a lot of crossings and interesting. So 
there are some, the, the idea, I guess, of the association would be also to foreground these different models and give examples of how things could be, could happen in different ways and, uh, as you say, also benefiting different kind of sectors mm -hmm. and ideally creating those bridges that aren't there. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Mm -hmm. First of all, PhD students, early career researchers are first class passengers in this association, okay? <laughs> so it's really, I mean, and thank you for the offer because I think you're quite right that in, in Ireland at least, the institutions, the cultural heritage institutions are pretty aware of DH and pretty active. You know, the National Archives and the National Library, you know, have been friends of sort of the, the, the kind of the, the community for a long time. But like the iSchool, the kind of the library and information studies, that actually has been a little bit at a distance. So actually it's a really interesting comma and love to kind of work with you to kind of figure that out on the Irish side. Because I think that's not the case in the UK, that you have much more of that integration. There's been more to encourage that over time. So I think that's a great, a great offer. Hiya. Hello, um, I was also um, not triggered, uh, that's not the right word. Um, I felt like I chip in um, on your um, contribution and also on your remark. I'm very happy to hear that in Ireland there is more connection than you feel between information science and the digital humanities because I was just saying to Elisabeth, you know, but that's, that's not true. And she said like, but that's in Germany, you know, um, so. <laughs> And it made me, of course, aware that the situation can be so different in different mm -hmm. countries. So, like, um, I also I feel it's much more connected. Um, so um, maybe that's also good then, because you said, how can we look um, beyond the borders and build again um, also um, connections to have a look like we, how this. Uh, I'm, I'm also through my English um, today. <laughs> So we can chat about this, um, um, the integration of the sectors. And I also have one question because I don't know, um, it, it, I made a big question mark, like several. Um, I don't know who said it of you, um, that there was a problem with the funding that was either regional or global, or it was on one of your slides and you, you uh, quickly skipped over it and, and it, it st stuck somehow in my, um, head, what did you mean by it? <laughs> Thank you. We have to confer amongst ourselves. I think that, oh, sorry. I think that point was, um, was that the point that, that Jennifer originally made about mm. the, the sort of the, the national, the sort of the global nature of DH yeah. versus, versus the, the national yeah. level of funding? I think that was... Yeah, yeah. I, think it, I think it was very much that there is a very you know, knowledge finds its way like water. But, you know, just the way nations set up borders and rivers don't respect them, you know, disciplines tend to be very, very broad and the dialogue can be very, very broad. But oftentimes, you know, if you think about some of these European programs where it's like, you can work with Poland, but not Germany. You can work with France, but not the UK. You know, these kind of, because of who buys in. And then all of a sudden, the partner or the, the organization, and actually what was really interesting is when we had that inclusivity event, um, we had participants from India. We had participants from, um, I wanna say there was at least a few participants like coming from the Global South who were really interested in this kind of UK Ireland conversation simply because they felt culturally that this was an interesting space to be in and they wanted to be in it even though like we were under funding from the Irish Research Council and the Arts Humanities Research. And it was like, eh, well, look, we're open, you know? So, but how we actually, you know, when you're being funded and you're, 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 you're being measured, the success of your funded activity is being measured upon the impact you make in a certain geographical space. And of course, this is, this is a challenge that goes well beyond us, but how do you actually be, in, be truly inclusive and be, you know, be open and globally supportive and get the maximal value out of that, you know, being a part of a global community and still meet what is ultimately the requirement for a certain group of taxpayers and their representatives. That I think is probably what you saw in the slides, but it may be just the way I talked through them was a little bit uh, misleading. 
Any other questions? Any other comments? Anything that you've been inspired to say? Just to, to follow up on a point that Charlotte made in, in response to Melissa's question. Um, it's about the, the fact that, you know, that there are five of us here sitting on the stage and a couple of others who presented via, um, via the online format. But, but we, we are not, we do not plan to be a group of people who dictate the, the terms of, <laughs> of the association in the future. And if there's you know, a panel in five years' time and the same faces are on it, well, then we'll, we'll have failed in one of our objectives. So it is a, a really crucial point to, to keep in mind that we, we seek people's participation in, in this association and that we invite you to, to find us and to get involved and to find our social media and our website and Michael mentioned the, the, the mailing list. So that is, is something that I think the association really needs to, to grow and flourish. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I think there's no better way to end this session than with that sort of rousing chorus to, to really kind of, you know, we're here up on stage, but it's, you know, it's, it's your association. So we really look forward to, to working with all of you in different ways to help to build it um, and to make it a real benefit to what the community needs and what the community can use to flourish. So I think we'll close there and go have a cup of coffee to fortify ourselves ahead of the dinner in the Schlossberg. And thank you all for your attention and for your great discussion and questions.